Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Steph. Good on you. Well, um, we'll start as we did uh, with the other field day with a, a welcome to country. So I'd like to acknowledge the Wiradjuri people who are the traditional custodians of the land. I would like to pay respect to elders past and present of the Wiradjuri nation and extend that respect to other Indigenous Australians who are present. Um, I did mention in the last seminar that I've been actually uh, learning a bit of a Wiradjuri language from a local Wiradjuri chap. Um, and um, I've, I've come up with a phrase, da, da gunna nana, which means um, to care for soil and nurumbang na nana, to care for country. And I think it's, it's a good enough um, overview of what this project um, that we're doing here at the moment, the Carbon Calling Virtual Field Day series is uh, come out of a, um, a group of growers that got together with Soil Sequest, uh, funded by the Australian Government Smart Farms Grant, uh, Ian Potter Foundation uh, with in-kind contributions from ANU um, and uh, four or five land care groups around the district. Um, the soils, Climate Resilient Soils Network uh, was born a couple of years ago. Um, COVID has got in the way with some of our research, but we pushed on this year and got trials in the ground. Um, and part of that process was to report on um, what we're up to out in the paddock. The framework of the, the research to, uh, to basically engage growers that are doing uh, interesting and um, innovative work and to start putting some science around that towards ways that we can increase soil carbon um, in cropping systems in this instance. So um, soil carbon in cropping in an annualised cropping system, um, it's easy to lose and it's hard to build. So any systems that can actually um, move the meter on, uh, move the needle on, soil carbon and cropping systems we're really interested in doing. Obviously for you know, multifaceted reasons of uh, soil health, soil fertility, uh, resilience in changing seasons, and also every kilo, every tonne of carbon dioxide we can pull out of the atmosphere and put into the soil um, also helps to mitigate climate change. So today um, you um, come along with the, uh, the second one in the series. Um, I see we've got quite a few more um, on here today than we did last time. I think it was 51 last time and with, um, there'll be some new faces coming on board today. Um, so I thought it was wise just to give some of that background on, on what we're actually doing here. Um, we've got a good lineup here today. We're at um, Stuart McDonald's property. Well, Stuart's at Stuart McDonald's property. If we we're in a, a real field day, we'd all be there and eating sausage sandwiches and, and having a cuppa. Um, instead, we're relegated to the Zoom room. Uh, but Stu's uh, braved the weather, um, it's misty rain and a bit chill, um, but he's out there in the paddock. Uh, hopefully they'll have enough bars on his mobile phone to give us a bit of a look at the paddock and what we're up to there. Um, we've also got David Hardwick uh, here today. Uh, David's an old friend from uh, many years. Uh, David, have knocked, David and I have knocked around the bush and, and crossed paths. Uh, David's an excellent speaker on uh, soil health, all, all things soil health. Um, but particularly today he's going to be talking about um, the trials that are actually in the paddock um, is around compost applications, mycorrhizal inoculation and the two of those together and working out what are the principles in, at play there that may increase uh, soil carbon. Um, we're lucky enough to have uh, Professor Justin Borovich um, and Dr Wolfram Bus from the Australian National Uni University with us today to talk about the recalcitrance of carbon, the longevity of carbon and the different fractions of carbon that are in the soil. So it's like that old ad, oils ain't oils, for those who are old enough to remember that ad, um, it's soils ain't soils and carbon ain't carbon. And there's a, there's a whole range of things to look at there um, in the different fractions of carbon that exist in our soil. So um, we've been working with those guys down at the ANU to work, work through some of that new science. Um, at the end, there'll be a panel discussion so we'll all um, open it up, open the floor up to questions and hopefully get a really lively conversation uh, going. So uh, without further ado, we might, um, Steph, you've got a video there to play. So we've been capturing some of the stuff happening out in the paddock through the season on video. So we'll just play a little two minute video and then we will um, uh, we'll go for a bit of a conversation with Stuart uh, actually out in the paddock. So over to you, Steph.
just checking that everyone can see that. Yep. We're here. Yeah, my name's Stuart McDonald. Uh, I live in Canoundra and we uh, farm on 1,400 hectares here that in a zero till system that we've adopted two years ago, moving from minimum till and uh, growing wheat, canola, chickpeas, uh, experimenting with um, the, the, the fit for multi-species forages. Um, we have uh, livestock in merino sheep and cattle um, on the place and we use those to graze um, both our crops and uh, permanent pastures. Guy approached us this year and said he had uh, some mycorrhizal fungi that he wanted to coat our uh, seed with and uh, see if there was any effect compared to bare seed. That was uh, also done in combination with uh, some compost that was uh, spread on areas of the paddocks. So two quarters of the paddock had uh, compost and uh, alternate strips of uh, the wheat paddock had uh, the mycorrhizal fungi coated on the wheat seed. Being part of what Guy's doing, it's about normalising the, the benefits of carbon um, and, and seeing the agronomic benefits of that. I'm very aware of the agronomic benefits of having carbon, but less familiar with how I can reliably and, and consistently add carbon to my program um, without costing me a whole season with a green manure crop. So I think um, being part of what Guy's doing is pretty exciting. Uh, I think he's doing great things and I think it just uh, increases our confidence to know that you know this is what works in our environment and we can replicate this and, and apply it more broadly. Thanks, thanks Stuart for those kind words. Um, it's good, uh, it's really nice to be able to take a bit of video in a good season. Um, 18, 19 wouldn't have looked uh, so um, glorious as it does there now. It really does look a picture over there at Stu's place. Um, Stu, um, the people that are involved, I guess, in this uh, Climate Resilient Soils Network, we've kind of cherry picked a little bit because they're people that are uh, looking at complete systems, putting whole packages together in their farming programs. And I was reading an article uh, yesterday um, about comparing the way that we're thinking about building soil carbon. If you're a banker, you want to uh, commoditize something, you want to put it in a little unit box and sell that box on to the next person sort of thing. You want to unitize it. So they want you to stock the soil in the ground and lock it away and throw away the key sort of thing. But in the farming game, that's not really how it works. You're more managing the economy um, of the carbon. That's more you know, a grow and flow sort of scenario. So it's building carbon the soil is more about adopting a system than any particular one strategy and, and maintaining that system over time to build carbon. And certainly what attracted uh, Soil Sequest to your operation um, with, uh, you know, pushing the boundaries, having a look at different things, uh, uh, particularly we'll get to the, um, the actual trial that's on the, uh, on the paddock there in a minute, but I'd like to tease out a little bit more um, about your experience with cover crops in particular, multi-species cover crops and single species uh, cover crops, because I know you've hosted a GRT, GRDC trial on the property and you've played around with it yourself. Um, what are your thoughts there as, a, as a, a integrating cover crops uh, into the crop, uh, annual cropping system? Thanks, Guy. Um, is my audio working okay at that? Is that Excellent. Yeah, I, yeah good. Uh, I was, um, I've been interested in it since 2018 and, and doing some travel with a, a Nuffield scholarship where I was exposed to, in America and Europe uh, to the benefits of cover cropping with people that have been doing no till and covers for, for a number of years. Um, I hadn't seen any of that work done locally. I, I came back and thought, right, I'm into it, I'm trying this. Um, and so, first summer, I put a multi species cover in with our Lexi coil uh, time machine and um, we um, had some success but it was really clear to me straight away that we were going to uh, dry the ground out in our environment too much in summer to uh, reliably establish covers so um, for covers to establish reliably I think we we had to make the, the transition to discs. Uh, discs also fitted the um, uh, the idea that we weren't going to be burning carbon every time we went over the ground planting a, planting a crop. Um, the scope here with, um, we were in a very similar environment to Luke yesterday and uh, with the 
non-seasonal distribution of our rainfall, we can um, pretty reliably get a get a cover established most seasons. So um, the idea is we have to get it in though pretty quick because it does get hot uh, and get it established. So uh, that's where the discs fit it into that. And with, with the last couple of years, we've really found we haven't been using all our moisture. Um, there's just been uh, the rolling averages just went over 900 mil, I think, uh, for the last 12 months recently. So um, it's just uh, been very kind seasons and we're finding uh, the, the soil can't hold the water and it's running off uh, and it's breaking out in some soakage areas, which um, we I see as a lost opportunity for both. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's one thing you saw in, um, you pulled quite a big crowd on the day a couple of years ago with that uh, GADC trial uh, with the cropping termination timing. So doing coven cropping and terminating it at different points to see uh, how that would impact the, the summer fallow moisture. Did you want to give a bit of a high level overview of what that research found? Well, from what I took from what Cole did there, there was, um, uh, there was a, the ability to grow high biomass um, crops, um, mainly cereals, sort of like sorghums, millets. Um, and there was also the ability to grow um, legumes. They didn't seem to do the bulk, but we thought they might in the summer, even though the rain was reasonably um, kind to them. Um, but they didn't, they didn't seem to fix as much nitrogen as I thought they would. Um, but so the focus then became, well, if we can grow biomass, we need to monetize that biomass uh, and we need to put it in a mix that's palatable to stock. Um, it's really hard to graze um, large areas of sorghum or millet uh, over summer effectively if it's growing. When it starts to grow, it grows by the day, not or by the hour almost, not by the day. So uh, it grows very quickly. So we need to be able to smash it down and utilize it while it's in that perfect growth, growth stage. Um, so I think for me, the, uh, the, the message was to grow biomass, try and utilize it. And if we can grow biomass and dry, even if you dry the profile out to 50 centimetres, uh, that extra root mass um, and that, um, that soil will then be in a position to take in the next lot of rainfall so much quicker than a, than a bare soil would have. So uh, the recharge was pretty startling to see that almost straight line recharge going on um, where there was, um, where there was a, a heavy load of organic matter. Yeah, and that's that's the exciting thing that I saw too. That I took away the, the same information that that's that um, ability for the soil to take on uh, rain events and um, for that rain not to disappear off the property. And uh, Mick Wettenhall's on the call here now, but he's coined the the phrase when uh, one farmer's talking to the other and say, "How much rain did you get?" You want to be able want to be able to say all of it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, exactly. And uh, yeah. don't let any off your place. So that, that recharge uh, numbers of that trial were, were quite impressive. And, and I think that's what it's all about. It's, you know, roots not only put carbon uh, back in the ground, but they also put pathways uh, down into your subsoil. And you want to be storing that water down in your subsoil. You don't want to be storing it up the top because it can wick out and dry off quite easy, dry out quite easily there. But it, it, you want to get it right down deep in the bucket, uh, down in the subsoil. And the only way to do that is to actually create physical channels down into that subsoil. And um, it's doing that at, at working out what that cost benefit ratio is of when to terminate and what the season is going to be like. But um, so I guess that's the, the art of the art of farming. But it was um, really interesting that yeah, you've, you've had both experiences of just doing cover cropping um, in the cropping system, but also integrating livestock. And I'd be interested in your comments on the, the role of livestock uh, in these kind of productive carbon building systems in your mind or your, your experience. Well, and my experience has largely been framed around what we did in 18 and 19, which wasn't much, unfortunately. Um, but uh, so in 19, we've transitioned into a new machine. So we weren't really set up, uh, sorry, 20, we weren't really set up to, to start this summer with um, with a lot of covers, but it would have been a perfect season to do that. And I think the extra carrying capacity you can get out of that um, with quick controlled grazes um, of uh, high, high stocking rates um, can, can not only uh, give you some value out of the cover crop, but also do some really good things for the soil. Uh, it'll smash a bit of that, that um, uh, biomass down to the ground. It'll uh, in, introduce biology that's not there currently uh, with the animals they, they're carrying around in their gut. Um, and I think it's, um, 
it's part of the way we can we can rebuild some of our soils. I think with uh, with livestock, I think without livestock, it's probably a harder road. But um, I think livestock gives us that um, opportunity to directly take some benefit from from a cover crop that's grown on opportunistic rain. Great stuff. Might um, where we're, we're always on time schedule with these Zoom calls, so we'll keep chugging along. I might get you to give us a little bit of a virtual tour um, through the wheat crop. I think you might have picked some plants out or something and just spend a couple of minutes explaining what we've done here. We did cover it in the video a little bit, but it's good to see it in real time what the crop's actually looking yeah, like. Sure. Yeah. sure. If we've got enough bars to do it. Yeah, well, I just um, I pulled up some plants. Um, the two on the outside are, are packed the area where we probably truck the compost in. The paddocks, that's not a great place to pull it up and look at uh, root samples, compost, but I'm not sure whether it's the uh, mycorrhizal or fungi or not. I'm not sure of the plan, but. Um, so what do we got? Uh, but uh, the sorry, which one? Uh, we, we, what sorry, are we sorry. what are we looking at there? Sorry, on the left hand side through to the right hand side. Sorry, yep. So left is um, uh, compost, and um, not sure whether it's mycorrhizal or fungi or not, but that's also compost, and. The, compost okay yeah I, suppose I was just trying to see and when you look at it closely uh, pan around to give you an idea of the crop um, that's a crop. great service yeah the crop's looking good it's a Beckham variety of wheat which um, usually looks terrible prior to putting a header into it um but this is looking as good as I've seen it look. So, yeah. Um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see whether we can see on the yield data whether there's any uh, compost difference and, and mycorrhizal difference uh, across the board. We should be able to tell with alternate strips of mycorrhizal fungi and, and the uh, compost in two quarters of the paddock whether there's been any difference, hopefully. Great. Well, on that note, we might uh, flick over to, thanks very much uh, for that, Stuart. That was excellent. Um, we might go to um, David Hardwick now. So um, Dave's going to tease out what we might be looking at there. And um, we have got the ANU team standing by for us to send soil samples back down to Canberra and uh, measure the carbon levels, measure the fractions, um, mycorrhizal colonisation. Um, so that we can, um, unfortunately, we haven't got that data here yet because it's not the end of the season, uh, but we've done baselines on that paddock um, and uh, at the end of the season, we'll retest and see if we've made any gains. But um, I'll flick over to Dave. He's got some pretty good uh, pictures there, but he might tease out how these principles uh, come into play. Thanks, David. Over to you. Thanks, Guy. And thanks, Stuart, for that. Um, yeah, I've probably got going to leave you guys with more questions than answers by the end of this one. But anyway, see how we go. Uh, yeah, no, thanks for having us. And um, I really enjoyed the last session. So anyone who missed last session, it's really worth watching that video. Um, it was a great session. Um, I guess what I'll do in this 10 minutes or so is, yeah, just more show you some uh, some paddock examples of not just uh, mycorrhizal fungi and compost, but this whole challenge we have of rebuilding soils. I've got this photo here, which is 2008 in Hermidale, um, Hermidale West of Ningen, a wheat, wheat crop, a young wheat crop. That's a biological farmer. Um, uh, back in the day when Guy and me were chomping around in the early days of biological agronomy, I like this photo because it's really, really highlighting, obviously, this challenge we have, which is what are the pathways to increasing soil carbon in cropping systems, in low rainfall cropping systems? And that second question, which we were kind of trying to deal with in, a, in our own way back then too, I guess, Guy, which is, can biologicals help us in this process, if I use that broader term? Um, and I think the answer is that it's more complex, but um, it's great to see you guys doing very specific paddock trials. Um, so I'll keep, I'll keep rolling. Um, the other thing that I'm going to do in this is bring you some examples from North Queensland. So Guy, you mentioned that you thought I might be up in North Queensland. For the last seven years, I have spent pretty much about nearly half of 
of my time literally doing extension along the particularly the wet tropics of Queensland in the cane sugarcane farming systems and communities and also grazing and tropical fruits but they've had a lot of money because of the Great Barrier Reef which they fortunately live next to and unfortunately means that they're now legislated uh, in how they manage their soil but the other thing about the cane industry is that it was probably the first major widespread or main industry in Australia to really investigate and research soil biology soil carbon soil health um, they were forced to they had a, a yield decline nationally across cane from New South Wales right through to Mossman in the wet tropics and by the late the, early, the late 80s they were plateauing and in fact going backwards the more inputs they used so they put it they put a 13 year R&D project into it a very significant and they really um, spent a lot of focus on soil biology soil health etc soil carbon so this i think there's some really good lessons that um, other areas of australia can learn from so i'm really keen to share that just one because they're pretty amazing farmer systems and there's some amazing farmers up there so i'm going to call this presentation essentials plus compost and mycorrhizal fungi and i'm going to spend a fair bit of time on the essentials not that we have lots of time um, so I guess I do want to just start with a little quiz, and this is a quote from my current favourite book. There is no need to be pessimistic about soil when soil making can be rapid and cheap. I'm not sure I 100% agree with that, but I'm, I'm kind of halfway there. While it is true that only one tenth of the Earth's surface is covered with soil and not too much of this could be classed as highly fertile, it has to be realised that agriculture itself can be a soil making process. So that is from 1954. So I'm gonna see who gets that by the end of this presentation. So agriculture itself can be a soil making process, which is I think the business we're in here now that in our modern high production farming systems, can we re reboot or rebuild soils? And obviously carbon is at the heart of that um, while, while being productive and profitable. So we're, I guess guys sort of mentioned it quite a few times through the the presentation previously in this one we're trying to build a soil system i use the term soil system and for me it's a fundamentally different way of looking at soils and that system to a great extent can do what we call self-organized so the roots in in relationship with the minerals and the soil microbes and the symbiotic organisms and the soil insects and the air and water can kind of arrange itself if you like into a high functioning soil it does need some help sometimes obviously if you go if you're the wheel if all four wheels fall off you've got to put some wheels back on but the system overall can self-organize this is a cane field i'll show you a picture in a little bit of a of a side by side this is a multi-species cover managed no-till um, regenerative cane farmer ray zamora is his name and there's a great video on ray if you do want to check him out the first cane farmer in, in the world probably to do a multi uh Crop, 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 uh, crop roll a multi-species cover down and plant cane all in the one pass so we're talking really innovative stuff um, and i've used the five elements of a soil system air water soil life which obviously includes fungi uh, soil minerals and plants so i haven't used the word organic matter because i think that's that's one of the fundamental changes we've had in the last 10 years is we used to think all right we've got trash or litter on the surface um, and that's you know organic matter feeding the soil but we now know that it's the living roots of the growing roots of living plants and the rhizo deposition and those uh, other activities that living plants do that's that's probably more important in arranging and optimizing this soil and putting carbon in the show so just to give you some context for some of the stories and i do have some cropping pictures more as well down in our neck of the woods um, but yeah this is um the wet tropics cane land basically um and this is pineapples there are other crops growing some niche crops but basically you're in the tropics it's warm all the year round you get four meters of rain the microbes are just happy so they break down everything and it all gets breathed back into the into the air so we're dealing with soils that can have an aluminium content of 50 60 percent exchangeable aluminium so they can be quite challenging but the challenge of building carbon in intensive cropping is the same as what we have here in the dry land cropping zones where Stuart is and we were talking about um, but it's this challenge of how do we build soil carbon and I just thought I'd throw this picky in because you can if you have a look carefully at that topsoil or the a horizon it's a bit messy because of the excavator toweling up the side but it's a what they call a daintree sand this is north of mossman near the daintree river uh, and you can see it's actually a coastal peat so it's a very high carbon soil that they turn from swamps into caneland in the early days so just refreshing again 
that key principle um, that was really well highlighted by uh, Dr. Sue last time. And that is, I guess, when we're talking about building soil carbon, it's really just the amount of biomass you grow, the quantity plus the quality. And that's, that's where the legumes and, the, and the, that quality, the biomass is critical. Above ground and below ground, that's the first key part of it, I guess. The second key, key part of it is your respiration oxidation, i.e. the breakdown and loss of carbon as a gas. That's what respiration and oxidation is versus the formation of humus. Now, I know that's a big word that covers so many things and the guys at the end of the presentation will probably tease that out more, but I'm just going to call it long-term carbon. So it's really how much is going in and the quality of it going in above ground and below ground and how much is going back as a gas and how much is stabilizing really. Um, and you can see here, this is a complete contrast, sorry, to the previous slide, which is a rainforest in North Queensland, where the organic carbon percentage, even on quite low fertility granite soils, can be 12%. So they're forming what we call a, a forest soil pattern. Uh, here is uh, up, this is in the Dimbula irrigation area west of Cairns. Um, this is Rhodes grass. So generally, the theory is when we grow perennial pasture, when we have a pasture phase in a cropping system, the roots of the, the perennial grasses will build organic matter, help with structure, et cetera. This is an example where that's not happening. It's a Rhodes grass, <coughs> hay production irrigated paddock. Um, it should have a good root system and therefore have a reasonable amount of carbon because it's bombed with urea to grow the grass <coughs> and it's warm and hot and there's compaction because of the haymaking machinery. The carbon levels in these paddocks, and I've seen them across from central Queensland right through, they have the same pattern because they're managed the same way, is usually 0.7%. So that kind of goes against that idea that, you know, your perennial grasses can build carbon. And that's because in these systems, respiration is at full speed. You're watering it all year round, it's growing most of the year, you're then giving it way excess nitrogen. And this was actually part of a nitrogen trial where we were measuring deep, deep nitrogen and seeing how leaky the system was, again, for the barrier reef funded sort of projects. Um, so you can see here the carbon to nitrogen ratio in these soils is like seven to one, which is chicken manure. So you can see they're hot, they're hyperventilating. So it's very hard to build long-term carbon when your resp respiration rate is so high, even though it's a perennial grass. Obviously, the key constraint is there's no root volume um, as well as the overload of nitrogen probably. So here's sugarcane. Um, it's a little bit of a different crop to other cropping systems. It's very intensive, but it's a four or five year crop because it's a perennial grass. But after about five years, because of soil constraints, the grass runs out of puff, the return crops, they call them the second and second and following year crops. So they eventually renovate the paddock and regrow. They have a fallow break of six to 12 months and then they'll regrow. So again, the thing about sugarcane fields is they're often not short of organic matter. It's a mountain of organic matter on the surface. Uh, there's not always a lot underground because of compaction. The root volumes have shrunk since the 70s when the heavy machinery came on. And that's been their big problem is low soil organic carbon. So the industry, when it did its 12 years, 13 years research onto why yields were declining, identified soil health as their main barrier. And that's three parts to that were soil carbon, was disappearing soil structure, i.e. compaction, and soil-borne diseases. They were the three big hammers on the system. Um, and you can see that in the tropics, respiration and breakdown of that organic matter is very high. So in those intensive systems with poor, poor infiltration, et cetera, no aeration, no root volume, or the root volume's really shrunk. And it's really interesting. I talked to the old cane farmers that remember the pre-large machinery days of the 80s, like back into the 60s and 50s. Their problem was they used to block the tines up with root volume when they were preparing paddocks. And nowadays, it's lucky if you have any root volume. And that the work really showed the significant reduction. Okay, so, uh, yes. On time, we've got about three yep. minutes. Great. All right. I better scoot. So the key thing here is um, this is a this is an example of right next to a cane field where they've been able to build organic carbon up to 17% through a forest pattern. Um, and that's because they've stopped the tillage, they've lowered temperature at surface. So it's these things like lowering temperature at surface, which is really important, as well as that infiltration of water, but protecting the surface and lowering temperature reduces that oxidation. Um, this is the new cane systems. This is multi-species cover cropping in cane on controlled traffic. Uh, and this is a high legume multi-species. And this farmer here, Alan Lynn, has been able to reduce his 
nitrogen from 180 to 120 units in this cane and an increase in yield. This is an example for you getting to the business end of it where uh, Ray's been able, you can see the side-by-side -side comparison and it's that root volume and the rise of disposition and the influence of actively growing roots because traditional cane will be a bare fallow um, rather than an active plant growing fallow. And you can see what that does to soil function and soil structure. So it's getting the essentials right, which is obviously minimizing compaction, ground cover, getting living roots in the system, as well as any major soil constraints like compaction or sodium. Um, but the other big thing I think that influences this whole show is lowering the solubility. Solubility, particularly nitrogen, really drives that respiration as well as probably influencing fine roots. So coming to mycorrhizal fungi, I've probably only got a minute left, so I'll have to go a minute over. Sorry, um, Guy. This is uh, Simon Matson, who did a Nuffield scholarship. Stuart, you probably know him. And he came back in 2015 and was probably one of the first to grow multi-species in Australia, um, especially in the cane, but overall. And they were measuring the mycorrhizal fungi in that paddocks and he was growing sunflowers in with sugarcane at the same time as well. So he's doing a dual crop or companion crop as well as in, so intercropping as well as multi-species tactics. They saw a 600 increase percent increase in uh, mycorrhizal fungi biomass and a significant increase in just from adding the seed of the sunflowers. No inoculum, just adding that. So that was a, that was Dr. Graham Sterling helping him with that. Um, so I guess the question I have the questions with mycorrhizal fungi and similar to the trial that you guys are doing there is that when we inoculate them, we're seeing these direct effects in the trial work where the inoculant is helping with plant stress and accessing phosphorus, for example, and probably helping there with the re-aggregation of soils to some extent and what I call the nutrient cycling capacity. But I guess there's these indirect effects of increasing over the longer term root volume and therefore soil carbon, longer forms of soil carbon in the soil that I think is still to be teased out in the practical R&D in Australian farming systems. No one's really looked at that next step that I've seen um, in, okay, we're getting these initial agronomic benefits but are we getting these secondary indirect longer term soil building, soil carbon building benefits? And I think if you look at the science around the world, there's mixed reports because it depends a bit on the context. Um, and the same goes for compost. So this is a tropical composter. We get these direct effects and you see it, this cane farm in particular has seen a significant improvement in nitrogen and structure of the soil. There's definitely direct effects of nutrient obviously and carbon to provide the soil organisms but that may increase respiration rate in the short term we're also inoculating the soil with those microbes that help us and some structural effect depending on the amount of compost you put out but what are the indirect benefits towards root volume and soil carbon in the mid to long term i think these questions are still really yet to be answered in particularly dry land cropping systems where the rates that you use compost out we reuse is much lower than in horticulture here's 200 tons the heck there but i'm going to jump through it so i guess here's here's near wellington on the compost trial that um, obviously has been going for a few years in the central west some of the trials and these are the questions i have is what are the direct effects from an agronomic benefit but then what are those indirect or secondary longer term effects? Can, can it help trigger that root, root deposition and root volume deposition that then start to trigger more humus formation? So I really put those, um, so the in agri inoculums like mycorrhizal fungi or the DSEs and like compost in this category that, of extras that sort of build on the fundamentals of the fundamentals being really building that root volume and the diversity seems to come into that as well and the biomass um, so that we can create this self-organizing soil system that's op optimized for our climate and soil type because I think as guys highlighted it's a community effort building soil carbon is not through one pathway obviously there's a liquid carbon pathway and there's a solid carbon pathway and there's multiple kind of sub pathways in that but we're trying to get that soil to really optimize itself for its climate uh, and that means managing the whole system as, uh, and I think the mycorrhizal and compost tactics are really just supplements in a, a lot of the time to that process. So sorry, Guy, I probably wait, try to squeeze way too much in there, but thanks anyway, everyone. I hope that's given you a bit of food for thought. Thanks, Dave. And um, it's interesting comparing that um, basically it's a, uh, 
a faster system up in the tropics, obviously, but the same processes are at play. This yep. respiration versus storage scenario yep. that you're trying to highlight there that happens rapidly up there and slower down here, but um, the same same process. And it's interesting. Um, I mean, one of the um, you know the obvious targets of this research is to tease out what does work and what doesn't work, and and apply science to ideas that people are trying. Um, sometimes you see agronomic benefits. Um, but, but you may not be gaining soil health benefits uh, that like you think you are. And that's yep. what you know, we hope to do in this trial to, to actually have a really good look at, at what's happening there and whether we're getting some gains. Um, so to dig a little bit deeper, um, thanks very much, David. Um, we'll, we'll go over to, um, uh, Justin and uh, about, someone probably needs to be on mute there. Um, so Justin and Wolfram have been working with us on, um, as I said earlier, on uh, looking at the fractions of carbon and why it's important to look at the fractions. So we might go over to Wolfram to actually explain what that actually means, the, the different fractions, what they are, how they're measured, and then Justin might tease out um, uh, the, the bigger picture of where we're tracking with that. Over to you, Wolfram. Sorry, I just need to find the presentation. There it is. Okay, so I hope you guys can hear me. Um, I modified the presentation a bit while David was talking. I thought sort of I tried to tie in what he said a little, go into a bit more depth. So um, this is sort of an overview of how basically soil carbon is formed. So starting on the left, left side here with um, CO2 going into the plant, being fixed by the plant, and then some of that um, carbon is respired, so it's lost again, um, while part of that is allocated below ground, and um, roots are formed, and um, part of that carbon is then um, exudated, or specifically um, uh, rise deposition, um, is bringing carbon into the soil. Um, and again, there's some loss directly from the roots and then some loss of those uh, rhizo deposits that are then decomposed by microorganisms. So this is basically the brown pathway here is um, lost by the plant and the red one is uh, lost by uh, microorganisms. And part of that is uh, stabilized in soil. So this is one pathway, the liquid carbon pathway, and then we have this sort of yeah, solid carbon pathway where we have the crop residues on the soil and um, where a lot of the carbon is lost quite quickly. Um, and then parts of that is stabilized again in soil. And um, we're getting now to those um, three main carbon pools. Um, and one of those is uh, particulate organic matter. And um, that's sort of the transition from um, shoot biomass from or also roots so from um, residues, plant material into the more stable carbon pools. And then we have two stable carbon pools. One is carbon in aggregates. So essentially occluded in aggregates, which protects it from oxidation, protects it from really microorganisms from decomposition. And then we have uh, mineral associated organic matter. And that is really the most stable uh, carbon in soil. And that is when really small dissolved organic carbon absorbs to mineral surfaces, which again protects it from uh, microorganisms. So they simply can't access that carbon and um, it is protected. And um, yeah, now I'll just go. So a guy was asking whether we can go into the lab and to show that it's a bit tricky at the moment still with lockdown. So we're working from home. Um, but yeah, so the idea of this fractionation is really that you start with, you sift the soil. So everything above two millimeter is, is sift out and that's could be plant roots as well. Could be um, sort of larger parts of, of from crop residues and that is not considered a soil carbon as such. Um, and then we have a, a partial disaggregation of that soil with sort of a gentle um, shaking. Um, and then we uh, sift that soil and have, um, Everything that's in this case, I use 70 micron, but uh, you know, that's 50 micron, 53, 63 micron, there's uh, various cutoffs there. Um, and then I do a density separation. So basically, a high density liquid 
where I separate out everything that's really low density that's floating. And this is this recently plant derived particulate organic matter. And I have a picture on the next slide really showing that um, it's still, you can still see the, the plant fragments in there. And then the dense uh, material is the aggregate carbon and everything that's below 70 micron is um, either material that is dissolved in water or it's material that is um, carbon that's sorbing really tightly to those mineral surfaces. So that's essentially, we've got four pools here now. Um, the dissolved organic carbon pool is really a very, very small pool, more sort of a transition between different states, between different pools. So would that be sugars and things like plant sugars and so on? Exactly, yeah, plant sugars, um, anything really that can, that can dissolve, that can be simply the transition because if you decompose organic matter, there are lots of different uh, compounds formed and that are then really low molecular weight, they can dissolve in water. Yeah, um, yeah I, I, unfortunately, I didn't find too many photos. Uh, I checked my phone and uh, those are the only ones I could find. Um, so essentially, you're starting with, uh, with tubes where we shake uh, the soil. Um, and then we've got here, this is the uh, particulate organic matter, which basically, um, so you separate it from this high density liquid. Um, and then here on the right, this is the picture I really wanted to show where you can see this is considered a uh, soil organic carbon because this is, is basically low, this two millimeter cutoff, but it's still plant derived. And so it's, you really can see those plant fragments in there. And if you have this fra fraction, basically a lot of this is still gonna be lost on the pathway to more stable carbon pools. And that's why this is sort of the importance. This is what I wanna stress in this talk, that this is the fraction that yes, you can build up quite quickly, by putting crop residues on the soil, but it can also be lost quite quickly again. And here, just a, a little bit sort of, of how that's then presented. Essentially, you have those three different carbon pools. And um, so for example, here in this soil, um, you have 1% total carbon, and then you have around 0.2% uh, of that is particulate organic matter. Um, what's that, 0.5 uh, or so um, is aggregate carbon, and the rest is, um, mineral associated. And then there are other soils um, where, where the, this, this just shifts. So Wolfram, what's the actual um, physical force that's, um, min when you say mineral associated organic carbon, mm -hmm. what's that word associated mean? Is it a, uh, yeah. is an electronic bond, electric bond or what, what's, how's All it sorts. So in? yes, an electronic bond that's basically, so it's, it's essentially a physical sorption process. So it's not a, in that sense, a chemical conversion or so. Um, but it is something that's reversible. So in, in that sense, it's not something that um, is, um, yeah, it's, it is a long-term stable carbon pool, but it can be reversed, this sorption process. For example, by adding extra um, low molecular weight carbon into the soil. And I don't wanna go into that, uh, that's, that's too much, but essentially it, it can mean that some of that carbon is then again by, used by microorganisms and that's basically then dissolving uh, that for mineral surfaces. So broadly speaking, what would the um, different time periods, the residence time for the different carbon pools you've got there be? Yeah, is, is the question I prefer not to answer, but <laughs> because it's essentially, um, yeah. Uh, let's say um, probably for, for aggregate carbon, and I have a slide on that, uh, so it can be lost quickly. Um, the mineral associated organic carbon pool is usually like on yeah, decades, but the problem is there is turnover. So you have you might have loss of some of that mineral associated, but also new formation as well again. And um, so it's essentially, it's it's really difficult to put really numbers on that because the soil is just so variable. Like if you look at the tropics, the, the, the turnover, it's just so much quicker um, compared to the dry land, so dry land area. So yeah, but unfortunately, it's really that, tricky to put numbers on that. Um, that none of those pools are like locked away forever. Um, exactly different exposure to, to going back up as carbon dioxide that's um, exactly it so here this is just uh, showing a little bit of temporal variability and on the next slide i also have sorry spatial variability the next slide i also have temporal variability so i'm um, sort of the, the summary on the right so the particular organic matter pool is usually can be formed quite quickly but it can also be lost quite quickly and then the aggregate carbon is sort of a pool in between semi-stable and typically follows this particular organic matter pool, um, but with a bit less fluctuations. And then the mineral associate is really sort of the stable carbon pool, the long-term stable carbon pool. 
um, with less sort of spatial and temporal variability. And um, yeah, essentially, if, if you just look at the numbers here, the um, particulate organic matter really is a large variability in there um, spatially. Um, mineral associated, there's um, far less variability. So just from 0 0.4 to 0 0.6, here from 0 0.1 to 0 0.3, so three times uh, variability here, it's just around like 50% or so. Um, yeah, just one more slide on this. This is really just now showing that um, there is temporal variability in those pools. So it's just a different side again, where you have uh, those three pools. Um, first, um, in September 2020, um, really good year, so mid, mid um, time point, um, and basically a lot of, quite likely a lot of formation. Unfortunately, I don't have a baseline before this sort of good year. Um, but what happened is then that um, in May 2021, so a lot of that carbon particulate organic matter in XC was both, a lot of that was lost again. And that's quite likely because it was a good year, which means there's a lot of formation, but a good year also means there's a lot of microbial activity. So that's why it, this carbon can also be lost again. And that's why you always need to sort of baseline just before and the sort of a good year started starts and then uh, pretty much a year later to see really the difference. The difference within a year is then giving you that build up, that formation. Really? Um, yeah, just this is basically the soil carbon. And just the last slide I want to finish up with that there's also a different um, type of carbon and that is uh, charcoal or biochar, which is essentially not part of this um, sort of classic uh, soil carbon. Um, it's essentially, a, 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 yeah, a really different chemical composition and that gives it um, recalcitrance against decomposition by microorganisms. Um, and uh, yeah, it is essentially means this process, you have a lot of sort of initial carbon loss, but then the carbon that you retain in, in biochar and charcoal is then uh, retained. Um, yeah, here at the bottom is just one of those um, one of the soil samples that I had, we are then separated out the, the charcoal, which basically, but um, you can clearly see that it's not this classic particular organic matter, but it's, it's black, it's clearly. I think I'll hand over to Justin. Thanks, Wolfram. Can you guys hear me all right? Yep, coming through well, Justin. All right, let's see. So I've got, um, I got my cartoon intro slide up. Thanks, Wolfram, for the you know the details on the on the carbon fractionation and the the pathways, the liquid carbon pathway, and, uh, and David and Stuart. So uh, let me um, try and take us home here, and then we can have a nice discussion. It's been a, been a good day. So I thought I put this point up front because regenerative agriculture is getting lots of press. The pendulum's kind of swinging back that might be overhyped right now. And what is regenerative agriculture anyway? Um, a lot of us proponents, uh, you know, it, it's everything to everybody and let's regenerate the world. But what does that really mean? And I think if we flip it around and talk about agricultural regeneration as the outcome, that that's a better way of thinking about it. it it's it's the results. Regeneration is each year your, your field's improving, your carbon is increasing, your water holding capacity, your nutrient cycling, rather than a, a label or a method that would or would not work everywhere every time. It's, it's a process. So I'd just like to introduce that to start. And then let's put this in kind of in a hierarchy uh, of benefits because we hear about all these benefits from different sectors where uh, farming community and agriculture uh, resilience might be at the top. We'd like to improve yields, of course, and regenerating degraded lands can improve yields. But as the climate gets worse, and even though we've had a couple of great seasons, we came off of a record uh, drought, and we'll probably go back to that. Uh, we shouldn't kid ourselves or, or forget too quickly. And so it's really about yield stability and resilience to to bounce back in these good years and then withstand uh, the rough years. And soil health is a big part of that. And soil health, I think, comes before soil carbon. We need to think about these cycles that uh, world from, it's not so bad to, to lose carbon from your soil if you're putting more in, 
then you're getting out, then that's, uh, that's on net uh, a big benefit. And we'll talk of, in detail about carbon stocks and, and flows at the end, because there is sort of a divide. Um, the other thing, of course, is that we don't need to go wall to wall uh, monocultures. It's great to hear people talking about cover crops and, and breaks between um, sugarcane or, or wheat. And, and as we're getting uh, erratic rainfalls, then having more soil moisture can allow us to, to extend the growing seasons. Um, but shelter belts are another way of, of hedging your bets in, in space as well as time. And I know Guy's a big uh, proponent of uh, fodder crops and alley farming and uh, could be larger or smaller shelter belts, but we can integrate um, agriculture into uh, a broader ecosystem and, and the, we can get certificates in biodiversity habitat for some of these uh, shelter belts, reduce wind speed uh, and evaporation, which holds the moisture in the ground, uh, at least shifts that evaporation, which is really just a loss back to the atmosphere toward transpiration, which is the, the water going out uh, through a leaf. And then when the water goes out through a leaf, it can pull carbon in. So that's the, the photosynthesis uh, is really, you know, benefiting from improved water use efficiency, which has a lot to do with the layout of the farm. And of course, the ground cover increases the infiltration as well. So we have less runoff. And Stuart talked about that. Now it all kind of comes together where we're getting a lot of uh, long overdue excitement from the climate community because we need to hit net zero. And, and what does net mean? That means we're going to reduce emissions and increase the sequestration and for agriculture we have certainly uh, emissions to reduce especially in the intensive cropping probably the over fertilization uh, and the runoff that david was talking about but uh, we can go beyond that and we can increase the drawdown and sequester carbon in the vegetation uh, in this soil uh, the transient soil carbon uh, but also in the long-term fractions that wolfram was talking about so these are the orders, the priorities that I, I put it in, that we can build agricultural resilience, uh, number one, because the climate's going to get worse before it gets better. In the best case, we've come in through probably the hardest, uh, more turbulent decades that humanity has ever faced. In the best case, we can take a little step back and try to build in this physical resilience. And ultimately, that addresses the kind of global issues. Now, we also should remember that um, you know, we think and track carefully all the uh, fossil fuel emissions. We're starting to now with satellites do a better job at tracking land clearing emissions and agriculture. We do have to uh, blame ourselves a little bit indirectly. Uh, forests are getting cut down for agricultural expansion. And uh, so those are the sources of carbon to the atmosphere, but the land sector is pulling down uh, more than a quarter of our pollution each year. And we're not getting credit for that. I mean, this is the, the base functions of, of, uh, of the ecosystems, mostly the big uh, forests in the Amazon, I'll show you in a minute. But we'd like to think uh, agriculture, which is half of the planet, uh, could be a big part of this drawdown solution. And the oceans are another one. Um, some of that is just dissolved CO2 and could bubble back out. Uh, but we need to work on ocean sinks as well. And right now, the land and the ocean are cleaning up about half of our emissions. So this isn't such a novel uh, thing to talk about, you know, even doubling the existing drawdown. We've got to take, uh, you know, give credit already. Now, what happens in the world uh, carbon cycle is that this industrial processes, we're talking, you know, electric cars and better efficient electric solar wind. And better efficient solar wind. But really the other side is the land use side. So it's about energy and land. And agriculture at the moment is a part of the problem, both directly and indirectly with the land use change, but it's also a big part uh, of the solution. So we'd like to shift. Agriculture can go below zero. It's not about reducing emissions. It's also about sequestration. Is that your headphones buzzing there, Justin? Is it coming back now or? Well, not. Is that any better? Can you be better? Oh, no, it's still there. Might be something else. That's all. Sorry about that. 
Uh, yeah, so look, here's one way of thinking about it. This is the gross photosynthesis. It's 10 times larger than human emissions, but it's a cycle. And the plants use their energy at night to live and grow. And the root uh, heterotrophic respiration and these microbes release it all. So the living cycle is an order of magnitude larger than human emissions. And we need to enhance that with better water uh, and nutrient balance for improved photosynthesis, ground cover, cover crops, uh, integrating a few trees here and there uh, will improve the drawdown capacity. And then we need to reduce the losses. So Wolfram started to talk about uh, biochar, the way of uh, making the above ground residues more permanent, which also improves soils and nutrient water holding capacity. And then, uh, you know, a topic for, for today's discussion is the soil health and the soil microbes. Uh, we're not going to, you know, completely remove those soil losses, but we can reduce them by minimum till um, and uh, other balancing approaches, such as the right uh, microbes, soil health, uh, the right balance of fertilizers. And then we need to reduce our fossil fuel emissions as well. Here's another picture that I always like to show, which just gives you that space and time in the biological carbon cycle. If we zoom in on Australia, we can see that um, the center is not dead. We do get a few good years where there's some background productivity. And the real advantage is both in the temperate regions, but also in the tropical regions in complementary uh, seasons. Yeah, so it's really, it cycles around. Um, now what this means in practice is that we wanna do the best job we can at capturing solar energy, um, thinking about uh, the seasonal uh, cycles, ground cover uh, and, and trees for, for light capture in, in the cold months, we are uh, energy limited in cold climates like Canberra, but uh, usually we're water limited. So it has a lot to do with uh, improving some of the physical uh, characteristics, but mostly this shift from um, reducing evaporation to increasing the transpiration and infiltration uh, and re-meandering streams and rehydrating the landscapes to really enhance this water cycle with an enhanced water cycle and nutrient cycle because especially nitrogen flows in the water. So we want to think about these inputs to plants because that becomes the input to the carbon cycle. And the above ground is for capture, below ground uh, for storage. And there's these physical processes, which I'll come to, uh, about making the biological carbon more stable in, in a geological form. Uh, the design um, is really important. We want to move away from kind of crops or pasture or forest plantation blocks to more integrated, mixed use, resilient uh, systems. Agroforestry, uh, cover crops, rotation, grazing, uh, integration, and we can do this in a very high resolution approach where we think about uh, not only the way uh, evaporation and, and we can model the solar energy very accurately. We can actually look at runoff and infiltration quite accurately and, and get a good handle on the spatial temporal dynamics of the nutrient cycles. So that can allow us to build these precision uh, farm systems. So the goal is to kind of do this at the, the paddock scale. We like to think about um, pixels that are uh, probably a hectare or so, and hundreds of millions of hectares in Australia have the potential for regeneration. Uh, that's mostly the cropping and intensive grazing land, but also some uh, rangeland pixels that do get enough rain that we can really turbocharge this, uh, this opportunity. So stacking the different layers, you know, they're, they're, we want to obviously uh, protect uh, the good um, soils and the good uh, habitats. Restoring some uh, is, is, you know, largely what our carbon farming is about in this country, kind of walk away and let it uh, recover. But going beyond adding the, the design for rehydration to get the moisture into the ground when we do have it, because there'll be more intense rains separated by intense droughts um, and Australia is really world leading in dealing with uh, dynamic, let's call it agriculture, getting the nutrient balance right, not overdoing it, not starving the plants either. And that can be biological approaches or you know, some uh, direct 
um, nutrient applications and, and weathered rocks is also really important in there. And together, this is kind of a regeneration system. So we'd like to get that yield up. And there's a lot of opportunity in Australia, which I think is being recognized overseas uh, with our land price uh, kind of skyrocketing uh, recently. And carbon prices are way up around the world. Uh, and Australia is a little bit uh, behind the curve. I think the foreign bodies are recognized it faster than we are. So let me finish with the, the last couple thoughts. We want to integrate uh, the above ground vegetation, what I talked about, the below ground soil piece that, uh, that we heard, especially Wolfram and his new uh, methods for quickly um, quantifying soil carbon in its various forms. And we're going to tack on, uh, once you've got soil in a tube, you can extract the DNA and we can look easily now at the sequences uh, of the microbes, track where they're going, verify that the inoculation is working. That's something we've done recently, which is this biological loop. Above and below ground, that's biological. And we're mostly thinking there about these flows from photosynthesis through uh, to respiration with some percentage. Maybe we can get up to 10% of the carbon is sticking around. And then complementary, we'd like to accelerate um, the recalcitrants, fixing uh, the biomass into forms that won't break down, which is you know, making coal in our lifetime through pyrolysis, as uh, Wolfram mentioned. Half of the carbon, uh, you know, is used to make the other half permanent, but that's a lot better than 90% of it breaking down. And that holds water and absorbing, uh, nutrient absorbing potential into the soil. So chop and char kind of idea. And the other geological tool for making carbon permanent is enhanced rock weathering. This is starting to get more attention now, especially around you know, the potential for alkalinity to run off into the Great Barrier Reef. So young basalt lava rocks, when they weather, when the root activity breaks down um, and releases calcium and, and magnesium, that, that alkalinity then increases the pH and sequesters carbon. You're accelerating the natural carbonate cycle. This rock weathering happens uh, naturally, it takes about a gigaton uh, of CO2 out every year around the world, but, you know, we've got a great mining uh, capacity in this country, so we could um, double that, triple that even. So the last slide is, is to try to, this is from uh, Feroza, a new postdoc in the group that's trying to put all of these uh, precision agricultural systems into a model. Uh, keep an eye out for, for DASIM, a dynamic agroecological simulator, um, where we track both the stocks and the flows of water and carbon. And the nice example that people use a lot for stocks and flows is the flow is the water coming out of the pipe into your bathtub, and it's going to be leaking out again uh, when the leaves drop and rot or when the soil microbes release that carbon. We want to reduce the losses, increase the gains. So those are the two biological flows that we're trying to manage. And what happens is if you reduce the losses and increase the gains, you're gonna fill the bathtub. And these are the stocks. Uh, so that's the way we, we model, right? The stock is what the geologists wanna sell on a carbon market, but the flows are what we want in biology and, and agriculture for the nutrient cycles and the water cycles and the carbon cycles. And so that's how they're, they're related. All right, let's we'll stop there and looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Justin. Good on you. So I guess um, we, we have actually run over time by a bit, but that's not unusual for a soil sequester meeting. Um, so I understand if people have to drop off, uh, that's fine, but we haven't had our forum panel uh, as yet. So if people want to stick around for the next uh, 10 minutes or so, um, we'll open the floor up for questions um, to the, uh, the the speakers here today, uh, any burning questions people like to have. Just I guess a bit of a summary of um, what we've seen here today. Uh, just jotted down a couple of the statements, and there seemed to be this common theme of this uh, stock and lock versus the grow and flow. Um, so developing systems that actually keep flowing the carbon into the system, and the bits that stick and stay, that's good. Um, but you've got to keep the system going to actually make it. Uh, so the carbon will stay in the system. So, it, and that fed really nicely into Justin's uh, statement at the start of his talk was that agricultural regeneration, regenerative ag, it's more 
an outcome uh, rather than a process or a method. So it's, it's something that happens when you adopt certain processes, you get regenerative outcomes. I think that's a great way um, that feeds back into that idea of grow and flow. Um, so we might um, see if we've got any questions from the audience um, and feel free to ask any of the, the panelists or each other for that matter, um, any questions that, uh, that might be uh, burning on the tip of your mind at the moment. Steph, I'm not sure whether you, you've got access to the questions you're in, have you, the, the pop Yes, ones? yes. If you, just, if you just pop the questions pop. into chat or raise your hand. Yeah, sorry, I should have said that. Yeah. Yep. Okay, so we have one from Jen. Uh, she says, hi, David. You mentioned 17% carbon in the soil in one of the farms in tropical Queensland. Is there a point where the carbon levels are so high that there's no more benefit to biomass increase to the farmer? Yeah, it's a really good question. And it's something in the, in the, that I've been thinking about for a long time because obviously you can build a peat soil, which is what they almost did. Um, I say almost because it doesn't function like a peat soil, which is a high carbon soil. But um, you can go beyond the functional level of carbon that you need, and that usually turns into a peat soil, which is doesn't have a great nutrient cycling dynamic, if that makes sense for agriculture. So that particular example is an old cane field that was bought for vanilla farming, and they just started mulching the vanilla beds because vanilla is an orchid that needs a forest so soil. So they didn't know how much carbon they would build. They just needed, they knew they had to mulch the soil. So the, the cane fields will have 1% carbon if they're lucky nearby, 30 metres away. And this soil ended up at about 16, 17%. And yes, the problem was that they were using very high lignin type material initially from rainforest prunings from council. And it started to switch to what they call a peat soil up there. And in that situation with four metres of rain, you'll end up with a bog and a marsh. So they started to bring in more legume content to the mulch and, and green leaves. And they found that that completely changed the dynamic of the quality of that organic matter. So it, it drained, it had structure, it didn't act as a kind of swampy bog. But yeah, there are, in my opinion, there's a, there's a threshold at which for agriculture, I need a certain amount for that whole soil system to work, but do I need more? You know, there's a sweet spot, I guess, would be the answer. So David, that nitrogen content made a big difference. To, uh... Yeah, it was fascinating guy because um, the, everyone's really aware of the peat, tropical peat soils because they're quite problematic to manage when they clear them. When they cleared them for cane, they're very challenging soils. They have a high carbon content, but their C to N ratio, they're, they're just difficult. And so they, they were really concerned. The grower, Fiona George is the name, she was really concerned that she would flip it into a peat soil, which was a valid concern. And yeah, so it was this quality of that material. The other thing really interesting from an agronomic point of view is the cation balancing and the pH is like spot on. Neil Kinsey would be having, you know, kittens. And yet she's never put any minerals out, whereas the, the cane fields have to lime religiously because the pH drops drops it where you look away and it'll drop two units because it's just four meters and it's acid soils acid forming soil so it's really interesting how that kind of self-equilibrium came in as well without any you know lime or gypsum or any soil amendments in that regard mm. no it was just relevant for last uh, week's seminar mm. uh, at luke woods and we were talking about a, um, a, a cropping with arrow leaf clover with canola oh. and natural nitrogen um, i remember that yeah 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 uh, yeah, that organic carbon and the, the agronomic impact on the soil health. Well, that's what I wrote down. My question for the group was along those lines from your carbon economy thing. And I think we've got to remember that that economy has a few different currencies and nitrogen's flowing along next to that carbon and so is water. And I think, you know, we've, we've kind of got these, these other two hidden, they're not hidden, but these other two markets, if you like. So I think when we're managing carbon flows or that carbon economy, it's not just the carbon, it's also the, the nitrogen and water that we're managing because they're all interlinked, obviously. So, yeah, that's, yeah, I think that's really important. Yep, great. Um, Mick Wettenhall, you've got your hand up. Do you have a question? Um, David, yeah, thanks for that, mate. That was uh, yeah. great, your presentation. There's a couple of things there. That 17% 
uh, increase that you saw there. What sort of time frame are we talking about? 11 years, mate. It's the most famous soil in Queensland, I can tell you. Soil scientists rock up there and they just can't believe it, but we've got all the numbers and the tests. Yeah, it was a 17%. And the Queensland, North Queensland soil scientist for the DPI, he's, he's measured soil carbon in rainforests, you know, and things like that for many years. And high fertility soil type rainforests can get close to that if they're intact and there's canopy cover and big leaf litter layer and all that and cool at surface but yeah it's quite phenomenal but again it's the load in the high amount of mulching every year but they also put shade cloth over the top you know to create a forest environment so they cooled the surface it's probably eight eight to ten degrees hotter 20 meters away in the cane field than it is there so those things are really important i think that and no disturbance there's you know the cane guys the traditional cane guys will use a rotary hoe at least four times in the yeah. in the renovation so you've got a lot of tillage so you can see the very difference in the management yeah no and that, that's the other thing that stuck out to me from your talk i haven't had much to do with that deal i assumed that sort of country up there even though it's a lot of it is quite sandy that, that um there would be have higher carbon levels given given the amount of biomass we're talking but to be sub one percent soil carbon and the the your, your slide with the with the roads grass that's 0.7 yep. Yep. And jack, jacked out with um with urea, yep. I mean the other one that that, that blew me away. Like yep. that's one of the methodologies they're saying that we can use is go from annual to to perennial, and to be have a have a perennial grass like that at 0.7 just shows yep. the deleterious effect of, of urea. Hey? Like yeah, and compaction, so no root volume because that traffic, continual traffic, and cutting it really short as well. So they're cutting it too short because of the machinery and the so there's the the perennial grass doesn't have time to rebuild root reserves or maintain root reserves you know it's a combination of all of those things because subtropical grasses dr rob banks work in northern new south wales showed you can turn cropping country you know increase three or four percent carbon level in over a reasonable time frame when you switch it back to subtropicals so um yes yeah, i guess a different different pattern again it's all about the context isn't it the sum of all everything you're doing yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, there's some basic principles to adhere to there, isn't there? Like the amount of carbon that is actually going physically into the soil in root mass, yep. uh, the nitrogen carbon ratio, so the, mm. the form of nitrogen. So, as uh, Mick alluded to, you know, there's, there's lots of research nowadays on um, synthetic uh, nitrogen, particularly urea, um, more like spinning your wheels and helping to actually build carbon. Um, you burn it faster than you make it. Um, with uh, synthetic nitrogen, so getting that uh, legume nitrogen into the system, but you've still got to get the carbon into the system. You've still got to physically somehow grow carbon and put it in the system. Mm. But, uh, we might get you down uh, to Stuart's place for next year's trials and we'll work out how we can get his paddocks up to 17% uh, next year. <laughs> put a shade cloth over it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, no matter what you do, though, at the end of the day, 17% in, you know, 10 or 11 years, like as an enterprise, even that 26 bucks where, where it's at at the minute, it dwarfs anything. Like <laughs> $36 spot yeah. price last week. Huh? $36 a tonne spot yeah. price last week. Yeah. So obviously you've got a much higher rainfall. You're talking a four metre rainfall. But yeah. they, can, they can have a problem. They often get too much rainfall. You know, those cane guys... They can grow biomass, but the warmth and the rainfall, the respiration, the bugs, are, the bacteria breakdown is massive. Yeah. yeah. Just, look, just looking at the time, we might just take one last question. Um, I think uh, Justin's been kind enough to go into chat and um, answer a few questions there. Um, there's just one last one from Jennifer West, um, who missed the first part of the session and just wanted to ask, does anyone have experience of incorporating biochar into agricultural soils? That'd be for you, Wolfram, would it? Well, I guess it's more experience of actually someone doing it in practice. I'm the researcher, but sure. <laughs> I mean, so I think that the difficulty with that is at the moment still sort of the production units um, are usually quite expensive. So to get really that amount of biochar that you need in terms of um, converting your crop residues, that's something that, um, yeah, it's, I don't think people really do it in agriculture yet as sort of a carbon sequestration method. They do it, for example, to produce a biochar fertilizer from it, and um, that then you apply in, large, in much smaller amounts uh, onto your soil, uh, but less so at the moment. Um, it's sort of more of an economy of scale thing 
um, for really um, for crop residues for a large scale carbon sequestration. But certainly, um, hopefully, we're on track to to manage that eventually. The the, the problem that I've seen is in the economics. The there was a project um, that, out of Dubbo where they were going to turn all the organic waste and feedlot manures and everything into biochar. Um, the economics on it was about four hundred dollars a ton of biochar ex Dubbo. Um, and you then you got to put it in a truck and get it out to farm, and then you got to put it in a spreader and spread it out on the paddock, or find some way of putting it uh, under the ground. Um, and we had yeah, big trouble trying to get the economics to work um, on on that scale. Um, and that was done, you know, at a at a pretty big scale. The uh, scoping for that. So the, there might be cheaper ways to do it now. I'm not sure, but back this is going back um, a few years now. But that, that's a perennial problem with the biochar on Broadacre, I guess, is um, how do you do it cheap enough to get out there? Um, that's probably, we, we have now, we're, we're getting worse and worse. We're only 10 minutes late last time. Now we're, we're 20 minutes late this one. Um, that's a uh, you know, typical field day stuff, I guess. There's always some uh, people hanging around a field day long uh, after the speakers have gone and walking through the crops. So um, situation normal, really. But I'd, I'd really like to thank uh, the speakers, uh, Stuart, David, Justin and, and Wolfram. Um, also the questions that came onto the floor, um, that was excellent. Um, I had better not forget um, our sponsors as well. So um, Dan Nicholson from uh, Topsoil Organics supplied, I think it was two B-doubles of, of compost to, to Stuart's operation, three, there you go. Um, so uh, that was uh, really good of them. They, they make an excellent compost here at Forbes and on SCART. Um, and also Sumitomo Chemicals donated uh, the Endoprime product, which is a mycorrhizal inoculum, one of the better ones on the market. Um, so that uh, Jock Lees was um, good enough to donate that. Um, we'll uh, keep them in the loop of how the trials work out and so on. Um, so thanks very much for that. And thanks very much for um, our um, broader supporters with the Australian Government Department of Ag and Water and Environment, the Potter Foundation, obviously the ANU and uh, all the land carers uh, that have been really supportive over the years as well. So Thank thanks, you, very much. thanks for being patient. And please uh, tell your friends next Wednesday, the 20th, same time, same station for our uh, last one. We've got... Um, a few good speakers again coming. Um, one of them not so sure of because that's me. Um, but uh, I'll be presenting on uh, some new projects that Soil Sequester's uh, angling at. Um, but we'll also have Noel Blair coming on to give us a, a real high-level overview of the carbon and uh, biodiversity markets that are evolving in Australia. There's lots of talk on social media and every, every um, newspaper you open just about there's something about the carbon market and the biodiversity market and the the massive opportunities are there for us all. Um, we're going to put that in a bit of context. Um, Niall's all over it uh, from that point of view to actually give us an international scope down to a national scope of what this market actually looks like going forward in the next 10 years and what the opportunities really are uh, for farmers to enter into those markets and um, try to drive this uh, regenerative outcomes that we're, we're all looking for. So thanks very much for everyone for coming. Uh, excellent turnout. Um, hope to see you all here next week uh, for another fun-packed adventure of, uh, of carbon building systems with carbon calling. Thanks very much. Okay.